As an aquaculture business owner, how do you tackle the balance in being able to run a sustainable business and being profitable at the same time? That's what we're going to be talking about in this episode. Welcome to episode 11 of the Business of Aquaculture podcast. This episode, I'm so delighted to have my very first woman guest, Dr. Diane Morrison, who is the Managing Director of Maui Canada West. Welcome, Diane. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. It's a pleasure. She is responsible for raising about half of the annual provincial harvest of British Columbia's farm raised Atlant- Atlantic salmon each year. Salmon is processed in Clam 2 and Port Hardy. Welcome again, Diane. I'm so delighted to, that you've given me time. I know how busy it is nowadays. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it is always busy in this industry. We used to have a quiet time and now it's 365 every day of the year we're busy so yeah but uh, but thanks again for this opportunity I've been listening to your podcasts and I really enjoy them thank you so let's get this show rolling my first question um, as I've asked for all of my guests in season one of this podcast is how did you get started in this industry well, it goes, a, it goes a long way back, back to high school. So I, I think I was probably like many young people when I finished high school. I didn't really know what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I'd always been interested in animals and I thought about becoming a veterinarian, but I just couldn't quite commit to, uh, you know, the eight years of university. So I traveled for a while. I went to college and then I did work in small animal um, veterinary clinics in, in Toronto as an assistant um, before I settled on this dream of becoming a marine biologist. So I went to the University of Guelph to follow that dream. And in my first year of my Bachelor of Science, I was reading an article, it was probably in the Globe and Mail, uh, and they were talking about the start of salmon farming here on the West Coast. It was the start of the blue revolution. It was going to be the new agricultural uh, sector for the century. And really, I think when I look back on it, it was sort of my aha moment. I'd be working on the water with animals or fish in a new food production uh, with a new food animal and veterinary care and oversight would be required. So all the pieces started to fall together. And that's how it all started. I applied to, um, to the vet college at Guelph was accepted and right from day one, I had the goal of working with fish and working with salmon uh, farming specifically. And really I had to I had to work it. I was an odd duck. There were a few other in my class at the time, but fish wasn't high on the curriculum at that point. So I had to take every opportunity to take extra courses. I hung around the lab with Dr. Hugh Ferguson in the fish pathology lab, made a nuisance of myself till they hired me as a summer student. Um, I traveled to the East and West Coast during the summer for courses and and work experience. And then I was lucky when I graduated, there was an opportunity here in Campbell River. Uh, One of the feed companies was looking for a veterinarian to provide technical services to their customers. and, And I got the job. And in hindsight, that was probably the best job for a new graduate coming out because I had a great mentor in Dr. Mark Shepard. And I got to travel the coast here in British Columbia and see the many different small operations that were operating at that time. So I got to see different methods, different approaches, saw successes, saw some failures. And as the farmers learned, so did I. It's perfect segue to my next question, but um, before I ask my next question on the pros and cons in the aquaculture industry, um, you, the story that you just mentioned on how your journey started and where you are right now in the blue revolution, it's almost like a dream come true we're in, you know, you never have to work a day if you love what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I say that to people that um, I've always been really curious and I ask questions and I drive people crazy because I keep asking these questions, but I'm, I'm really curious and I've never had a boring day in my career. Every day there's something new, there's something different. And really I couldn't have asked for a better career. And it really, sometimes I really look back and think, wow, I was really lucky. I picked up that newspaper (laughs) because, you know, who knows where I would have been if, uh, if I hadn't read that article and, and, and joined the blue revolution. I can't agree more. My previous background is as an auditor and an accountant. And so this industry has always kept me grounded and on my feet because it's so dynamic. There's so much changes every day. And I've been in it for only 13 years. And I will not say that in those 13 years, there's some things that are the same every year. It's always pun intended, ever changing sea. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So 
yeah, so I'm going to ask you the next question. So what have you seen in the, um, in the pros and cons in being in the aquaculture industry? There's, you know, there's so many pros when we talk about salmon aquaculture. Um, the vision, the blue revolution is what caught my attention 30 years ago. And it really, it remains relevant today um, because salmon aquaculture, all aquaculture really is the blue revolution. Um, so when I look at a farm salmon, I mean, it's got the lowest carbon footprint of any animal protein. When we think about addressing climate change and reducing greenhouse gases, salmon farming, salmon aquaculture should be celebrated and embraced. Um, it's sustainable. Uh, we have a continuous steady supply with minimal, minimal impacts on the environment. It's healthy and delicious. Um, and we have consumers that uh, are the ever increasing demands uh, for the consumption of this great food. And we are a vital component of Canada's food supply. We provided during the pandemic, we provided food security. Um, our, all our employees were deemed essential workers and our fish continued to be harvested and processed and moved to the, uh, the buyers, the grocery stores and any of the restaurants that were open during that pandemic as COVID allowed. So that was fantastic. When I look at the evolution of, of salmon feed, um, you know, it's been the changes in that have been impressive. We've re significantly reduced our reliance on marine sourced raw materials. They're always looking for alternative raw materials, well maintaining the healthy, heart healthy omega um, fatty acids in the salmon. And we provide full time careers in rural communities. Um, and this means young people, you know, the core of our business, no company survives without great people. And we have some of the best um, can find their careers in their home communities, they can stay there and support their families. We had quite a few young employees come back from trying Alberta uh, as a place to have their career. They miss their homes. They miss their friends and they didn't want to have that disconnect anymore. So they're now working with us and that's fantastic. And then maybe the last thing I would say is I'm really proud of the role that salmon farming is playing in reconciliation. Um, Moe is one of the first salmon farming companies to have a benefit agreement with the First Nations, uh, the Kittisu Hey Hey Nation in Klemtu on the Central Coast. And our agreement and relationship is over 20 years old now. Um, most of our farms have negotiated agreements with First Nations in the territories where we operate. And our relationships and agreements continue to grow and develop and strengthen. And we have a goal of walking together with our First Nations partners and co-developing businesses. And that's our vision for the future. That's amazing. It's always good to hear when people has maintained relationship for two decades and it's worked really well. And I agree with you. It's people, people, people in this business, as you know. Um, any cons in terms of what you've seen so far? I would, I would um, put it as a challenge. So yes. our, our challenge, and I'll just give the one because it's a big one. Um, it, it's our, it's the lack of a predictable and reliable regulatory regime. And I think you've probably heard this from other people who you've uh, had on your podcast. Um, you know, every business, it's not just aquaculture, but every business needs to know, have some predictability and reliability of the regula regulations. And this is to ensure that innovation and investment can continue. Um, we need predictability in the processes of the applications for new uh, tenures or licenses or amendments of existing tenures and licenses. And we don't really have that. And this predictability is what we need to secure our investment in the future. And we want to continue to evolve and innovate. And to do that, we need some predictability. And that's, that's sorely lacking right now. You know, if we could have these secure investments, it would mean a more sustainable future and more stability for our communities that we operate in. I feel you and I hear what you're saying. Um, it's been 30 years and we've still been clamoring to have a GUI duck management plan. And it's always been that uncertainty that has kept us always almost scared sometimes because we don't know what it's going to bring forth in terms of decisions regulatory wise and the bureaucracy, as you know, as well. Um, so hopefully there's more reliability and predictability in the coming three years, if I have to say digital decade, and they can catch up as well in terms of the changing changes in technology as well. That's really way too fast, especially after COVID, as you know. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We really need to, you know, take the bull by the horns and Canada could really be, British Columbia could be a leader in all our sectors of, um, of aquaculture. You know, we've got the three coastlines and we should really be taking advantage of that, uh, of that uh, resource that we have. 
Agree. So my last question to you is, uh, what are the three trends that you're seeing in the aquaculture industry? So something exciting to talk about and some something to look forward to. So I've got, I picked my three favorites because there's lots. The one is, is transparency. So consumers really want to know where their food is coming from, how it was grown, and they even want to know who the farmer is. So um, we can connect with the consumers by providing transparency and relevant information about the products they are buying. And we're currently doing this with our branded product uh, globally, Moe is. There's a QR code on the product that you can scan with your smartphone, and it pulls up information on the origin of the fish and details about its journey from the hatchery to the grocery store where you're holding the, uh, the salmon fillet in your hand. And I think over the next couple of years, that's really going to expand and become more of the norm for most foods, not only aquaculture. And I, I just think that's fantastic because we have a great story. All of aquaculture has a great story to tell. And the more we can get that out to the consumers, the better we'll all be. Um, I think from a production point of view, from a farming point of view, what we're going to see is what we call post-smolt um, production. And really, this is a trend to produce a bigger smolt. So up to 800 grams, um, the fish would be in size before they are moved to the marine farms for the final stage of their production. And what this really does is it limits the amount of time in the sea in the marine environment and limits the exposure the fish have to environmental stressors. But, and it also shortens our production cycle from a 12 month in the sea to uh, from our current 17 to 21 months. And what I think is going to be interesting to watch over the next few years is how that's done. Will it be done in land-based research facilities or will it be done in marine-based semi-closed um, tanks or, or containments? And that's that, that will be the interesting thing to watch. It's really exciting. I wonder if we have something in the Gouidac industry because as you know, in Canada, our shellfish grows 10 years. And you were just saying from 12 months to 17 to 21 months, I wouldn't mind having it three years instead of 10 years for a payback period. <laughs> exactly. Your gooey ducks are fantastic, but they are slow growing, aren't they? <laughs> they are market size, two pounds, 10 years. And even in the United States, it's half that. They have five years. So I would be interested to know how this post small production trend will be affecting our shellfish as well. But go ahead, your third trend. Yeah. So my third one, and this one is really um, and specific to British Columbia and our operations here, is what we call and, and what's talked about as an ecosystem management approach. Um, and this is really a wish for me. And, and so I'm hoping that over the next 10 years, we will see this adopted as a way of managing um, because it's a way of bringing together all the regulators, all the governments, First Nations and elected governments, um, provincial, federal and, and, and the farmers and finding a way to, to look at um, the whole ecosystem, to move away from single issue management um, into a fuller ecosystem approach, which allows us to keep both the social and our ecological systems healthy over the long term. So move away from, let's talk about one issue of the day and talk about the whole ecosystem with everyone at the table. And I think that will really help, again, address some of the negativity you might hear in the, in the lay papers and in, in the public and, and think of everything and the big approach. And I think that will give the security and the protection and the long term stability for our industry. Fantastic. Those are fantastic trends. And I'm really looking forward how it goes into place because there's such exciting times that we have right now. Well, thank you very much, Diane. And my biggest takeaway from this episode is I love the way how you, um, I guess, revamp the word con to challenge. So I'm just going to steal that and just ask people that. And in terms of the predictability and reliability that this industry is really needing from people who are decision makers to help really catapult the industry into a better and next level of its development. Thanks again. I'm really appreciative that you um, spent some time with us today. And to our listeners, remember you help build the home in the Philippines every time you listen to the podcast via the B1G1.com initiative. Share the podcast to your friends and family who you think may benefit. I'll see you in the next episode. Our guest will be Dr. Yomi Alabi, who is the president of Seed Science Limited, which developed and operates a successful floating shellfish hatchery with several innovative features enabling the high-density production of seed. Thank Thank you once again, Diane, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Bye for now.